All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining Audubon Great Lakes and my birds webinar off the beaten path, birding at Michigan's Wetland Wonders this evening. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining Audubon Great Lakes and My Birds webinar off the beaten path, um, birding at Michigan's Wetland Wonders this evening. We're going to be starting in just a few minutes. Um, please send any questions or comments through the chat box. Feel free to introduce yourself um, and let us know where you're coming in from. Hi again, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining Audubon Great Lakes and My Birds webinar, Off the Beaten Path, Birding at Michigan's Wetland Wonders. Um, we'll get started in just a couple more minutes, um, but take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat and where you're joining us from. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Erin Rowan Ford and I'll be kicking things off. Um, I want to welcome you all to our webinar with Audubon Great Lakes and MI Birds, My Birds, Off the Beaten Path, Birding at Michigan's Wetland Wonders. 
in partnership with the Wildlife Division of the Michigan DNR. Um, thank you for spending the next hour with us. We're hoping this webinar will be helpful because we know the physical and mental health benefits of experiencing nature are so important for all of us. Um, we also know that since COVID-19, people are still spending more time outside and continuing to connect with nature close to home. We're also committed to sharing information about engaging with your local public lands and making the outdoors safe and welcoming for everyone. On uh, with spring here right now, our neotropical migrants and secretive marsh birds are returning to Michigan and the Great Lakes, so it's a great time to get outside and go birding. I'm the conservation manager for Michigan uh, with Audubon Great Lakes, and I manage the My Birds program, which is an outreach and engagement program presented by Michigan DNR's Wildlife Division and Audubon Great Lakes that aims to increase all Michiganders' engagement in the understanding, care, and stewardship of public lands that are important for birds and people. And for those of you that aren't familiar with us, Audubon Great Lakes is a regional office of National Audubon, and we work across the five Great Lakes states to restore and protect birds and the places they need to thrive through on-the-ground conservation, as well as outreach and engagement and policy and advocacy. We have over 215,000 active members, over 50 chapters, and two nature centers. And our regional office is based out of Chicago. I will be your facilitator today, and with the help of Isabella Grobelna, our engagement manager, and Caitlin Barnes, wildlife biologist with Michigan DNR, um, who will be monitoring the chat box and will help to facilitate the Q&A session at the end of the program. I apologize if you hear my dog in the background. <laughs> A few housekeeping items before we get started. This presentation is being recorded, so all participants will be muted for the duration of the webinar. Please take a moment to locate the participant and chat function on the Zoom platform to actively participate in the webinar. I know a lot of us are pretty Zoom uh, competent now uh, after COVID, but if you want to send us a question or comment to the facilitator, please use that chat box. Um, we'll be monitoring the chat box throughout this webinar, so please be respectful and appropriate while participating. Um, we'll review the questions you've submitted in the chat box during the Q&A session. Um, Caitlin might be able to answer some questions live during the webinar, but she'll also hold some uh, for that Q&A session at the end. And this is Isabella and Caitlin, in case you can't see them in the small images, just wanted to make sure you guys can see them as well. So this is what's on our agenda tonight. Um, we'll be chatting about all things Michigan Wetland Wonders. We're going to learn about the state of the birds, Michigan's important bird areas, and Michigan's wetland wonders, along with how you can get involved. And then we'll wrap things up with our Q&A session. So the state of the birds, um, as many of you may have seen, the, this report called the Three Billion Birds Gun Report came out back in 2019. Um, that showed that we are seeing a pretty big decline in our North American bird species. So this report showed that we've lost 2.9 billion adult breeding birds since 1970. So that's about one fourth of our adult breeding birds. Um, and we saw declines across all habitat types and all guilds of birds. Um, grassland birds in particular, like our Eastern meadowlarks that you can see here on the slide, um, have seen some of the steepest declines. Uh, some of our favorite backyard bird feeders as well, uh, or bird feed visitors, um, like the dark-eyed junco and white-throated sparrow in fall and winter, are also seeing steep population declines. A couple of months later, Audubon released our Survival by Degrees report, which showed that 389 bird species in North America are on the brink of extinction due to climate change. Um, this study also showed us, however, that if we're able to limit warming to just one and a half degrees Celsius, as opposed to three degrees Celsius, we can help the chances of 76% of these bird species. And this is an example of a couple of my favorite Michigan species, um, the bobolink, a grassland bird, and the common loon that can be found in our lakes, um, inland lakes and great lakes uh, during these 
beautiful summer months that we have coming up. And you can see how much of their range will be lost in red. Um, and this is at a three degree Celsius uh, warming scenario. Um, but again, there was a silver lining to that study, um, and there is a reason for hope. Each one of us matters, has a role to play, and makes a difference. Um, I love Jane Goodall and, and all of her hopeful messages. Um, and we saw that as well in the Three Billion Birds uh, report. There were some silver linings there, too. Um, when we're able to work together and have some concerted collaborative conservation efforts and policy and advocacy come together, um, we're able to really make a difference. Um, we saw raptors bounce back from the brink of extinction thanks to the banning of DDT and increased environmental and wildlife protections in the 60s and 70s. Um, so we saw bald eagles uh, here in Michigan in particular, um, bald eagles, peregrine falcons, and osprey bounce back. Um, their populations really dwindled there uh, in the 50s and 60s. We've also seen woodpecker populations increase, and this is primarily due to improved land management practices. For a long time, we were suppressing burning and disturbance in forest practices, um, but now we're increasing those burnings and disturbance, um, and also have a better understanding of snag retention or keeping those dead trees around for these woodpeckers. Um, emerald ash borer beetle, while not great for our forests, it did cause a lot of damage that created a lot of habitat for woodpeckers as well. And finally, we saw waterfowl increase in population since 1970. And this is in great part due to waterfowl hunters who've been the leaders in wetlands conservation. Uh, wetland conservation is of increasing concern here in the Great Lakes. Uh, we've lost half of our wetlands here in Michigan, um, and that's due to development or conversion to agriculture. Um, but not all of our wetland birds are thriving. We still see that secretive marsh birds, uh, for example, are still seeing steep declines in the Great Lakes region, and see some of our waterfowl as well, as well even mallards, um, are seeing some declines here in the Great Lakes. So that's one reason why we're really excited to talk to you about Michigan's Wetland Wonders tonight. Um, these areas are considered Michigan's premier managed waterfowl hunt areas. Um, so while these areas were created to provide exceptional waterfowl hunting opportunities, um, their management of creating this high quality wetland habitat really is beneficial for other wetland wildlife as well. Um, and while these areas are funded by hunting license fees, they are actually free and open to the public to visit, um, use, and enjoy most of the year. Um, so right now, we don't have any waterfowl seasons happening in spring and summer. It's a great time to get out and visit these wetland wonders. Um, all of these wetland wonders also double as Audubon important bird areas. So important bird areas, um, the, this whole program with BirdLife International aims to bridge science with planning, advocacy, and engagement to protect uh, areas important to birds all over the world. Um, they have over 120 international partners and Audubon is the BirdLife International partner for the United States. Um, Audubon has worked with folks on the ground uh, in state and regional offices as well as chapters to help identify important bird areas across the country. Here in Michigan, we have over 100 important bird areas, 10 of which are globally significant. So those are the important bird areas that are designated in red on the map here. Um, all of the green important bird areas here are at state uh, recognized important bird area priority level. And the Important Bird Area Program here in Michigan uh, got started back in 2006 uh, with the help of Kalamazoo Nature Center, Michigan Audubon, Detroit Audubon, and National Audubon. Um, and they formed a technical committee that created a rigorous source of uh, criteria that all of the important bird areas had to fall under um, and developed this list of 103 important bird areas by 2010. So what does it mean if you have an important bird area? What does it take to become an important bird area? 
Um, so important bird areas have to support a species of conservation concern. So those are our threatened or endangered species. A restricted range species, which is vulnerable because they're not widely distributed. So one of my favorite examples from back home, I'm from California originally, is a wren tit. They don't move or travel very far, um, and they're a very restricted range species. Um, we also have habitat limited species, which are vulnerable because their populations are dependent on a specific habitat type or biome. So we have like wetland obligate species, like a lot of our vulnerable marsh birds. Um, they are habitat limited. Um, and then we also have congregatory species or groups of similar species that we see during migration, like flocks of waterfowl um, or shorebirds. Um, and these birds are vulnerable because they occur at really high densities in just a few places. So if anything happened to one of those places where they occur at high densities, it could be detrimental to the population. So important bird areas um, can be found on public and private lands. Um, but here in Michigan, over half of our important bird areas are public and owned and managed by Michigan DNR. So all of these areas are managed for multiple uses, and they're areas where a variety of bird species thrive across the state. And again, all of our wetland wonders that we're going to talk about tonight double as important bird areas. So they meet one or more of those four main criteria. So the first uh, wetland wonder that I'd like to share with you is the Fenville Farm Unit at Allegan State Game Area. So this is out in Southwest Michigan. And this 4,100 acre Fenville farm unit sits within a larger 50,000 acre Allegan State game area. And Allegan State game area is a globally recognized important bird area. Um, it's one of those that's known for its large number of vulnerable um, or management concern species. And it also has a regional source population for several area sensitive neotropical migrants. Um, so that means that this is an area that supports populations of breeding migrants um, that are contributing to their population. So it's a source population. They're actually adding adult breeding birds and um, adding young uh, fledglings to the population. So that makes that population even more important for the conservation of that species. And um, we also see, as you can see in this photo, um, very high concentrations of Canada goose and mallard in the winter at Fenville Farm Unit. Um, and over 140 species have been documented during breeding bird surveys here. So even getting out there in the summer provides a really great uh, diversity of species that you can encounter and observe. So the Fenville Farm Unit, again, is this smaller area of the larger um, Allegan State Game Area. And these are the maps that you'll generally find for these wetland wonders that can be found online. Um, and I just wanted to note, kind of go through what's on these maps, because um, again, these have been designed primarily for hunters, but if you're out there recreating or birding, um, it's helpful to just get familiar with what all of these icons mean. Um, so the legend down here is really helpful. They have um, usually identified a headquarters office or an information kiosk. Um, there are also parking lots um, accessible throughout the area. And some areas also have prepared ramps or boat launches with the little triangles. Um, and at the top of each of these maps, uh, there is contact information for the local field office or headquarters office for um, this particular wetland wonder. So here um, we have the Todd Farm DNR Wildlife Office and a phone number. Um, so if you have any questions or about planning a visit, um, we definitely recommend reaching out to the local DNR staff. Um, to get to know what their recommendations are if you have questions about where you can or can't access. I do want to mention that within this unit and outside in the larger Allegan State game area, there is a really great diversity of habitats. Uh, this area is in an area where, like an ecotone, so it's where we have northern and southern hardwood forests mixed together, and usually in these areas where you have um, this transition zone, you have a lot of habitat diversity and then a lot of species diversity and usually 
um, a lot of state conservation species of concern also kind of in, in these areas. So we definitely see that um, at Allegan State Game Area. At the Fenville Farm Unit in particular, it has become an eBird hotspot with over 2,500 checklists and 241 bird species detected there. Um, whereas the rest of the state game area only has 342 checklists, um, but still has 238 species detected. So still a lot of great diversity out there, but just not as heavily birded as the, the Fenville Farm Unit. So if you do plan um, to go out for a visit there, I encourage you to check out the Fenville Farm Unit and then also explore the rest of the game area since it has so much to offer. Um, in addition to wildlife viewing and birding, this area also includes miles of nature trail hiking opportunities. And then I wanted to cover this as well. So this is on the back of every wetland wonder map um, and it can be really intimidating to see that's a lot of text. Um, this outlines the hunting regulations, specific rules and procedures, and this is generally for hunters during hunting season. The only thing that could be applicable to you at any other time of year is maybe some of the activities under the prohibited section at the bottom there. Um, but as a as a birder, you are going to want to know when it's safe to go out, when waterfowl hunting seasons begin near you. Um, and we'll drop a link in the chat about where you can find that information online. Um, and again, if you would rather just speak to someone, you can definitely give that headquarters office a call. Um, to help you plan your visit. So Fenville Farm Unit also um, is a property that was originally used to grow peppermint and then DNR purchased it in 1949 and it's still primarily farmed. Uh, they grow corn and a bunch of other crops that they then flood during the fall to help provide food to migrating waterfowl. Um, and some shallow water wetlands have been developed there also in recent years to help with increased duck diversity. So there are some species of note that I'd like to share too, and this isn't just from eBird, this is from our important bird area report for the Fenville Farm Unit. Um, and I won't read all of them, but I'll, I'll mention a few highlighted species. We have yellow-billed and black-billed cuckoo here, um, golden-winged warbler and blue-winged warbler and cerulean warbler here. Um, Louisiana water thrush and loggerhead shrike, some of these are harder to find, uh, red-shouldered hawks and prothonotary warblers as well, and then eastern whippoorwills, uh, one of my favorite birds to hear at night in the summertime. I recently reached out to somebody in Kent County who was looking for eastern whippoorwills, and this seems to be the closest location where you can get them um, out at Allegan State Game Area. So, um, it's a great spot to explore during early mornings and evenings for different bird species. And this is one of those golden winged warblers, one of those beauties. And that eastern whippoorwill. <laughs> I love them. They are so unique. So the Fish Point State Wildlife Area is our next uh, wetland wonder. And this one is in the Thumb in the Saginaw Bay area. And it is part of the globally recognized Saginaw Bay important bird area. Saginaw Bay is also Michigan's largest watershed. And as you can imagine, an array of water bird species use this area as a migratory stopover site, wintering ground and breeding ground. What's really unique about this area and a couple of the others in that Saginaw Bay region is there are large migratory congregations of tundra swans, um, particularly in February and March. So early spring is a great time to get out to Fish Point if you wanna look at those species, those large swans. They also get trumpeter swans up there. Um, other high density species that you can see in the hundreds up to the tens of thousands, include American black ducks, mallards, as we have photographed here, redheads, common golden eyes, mergansers, uh, common mergansers, and scops. So both greater and lesser can be found there, but in the tens of thousands. Um, it's pretty amazing to see rafts of waterfowl that large out in the water. There are some important breeding birds as well that can be found at Fish Point. 
We have Caspian and Common Terns, which you'd be able to see now at this time of year and into June. Um, and they're nesting there. So those are colonial uh, water birds and they're both state threatened species. Uh, we also have ring-billed gulls, great egrets and black crowned night herons that nest there. And those are all colonial uh, water birds. It's also a great spot to view raptor migration, particularly in the spring um, and for snowy owl viewing in the winter. It was actually where I saw my first snowy owl um, in Michigan. So it was, it was great. In eBird, um, according to all of those checklists that have been submitted, over 2,000, they've observed 261 species. Um, and this is an area that also provides other recreational opportunities outside of wildlife viewing and birding. Um, you can go hiking and fishing. Um, there are also nature trails available here, and you can do some paddling, uh, canoeing, and kayaking. Uh, if you're also into wildlife photography, that's something that you can do at every wetland wonder. Um, this wetland wonder as well, Fish Point, is part of the Saginaw Bay Birding Trail. So there are several other pit stops, and you can head out and make a day trip of it, um, visiting all the other pit stops in the Saginaw Bay Birding Trail. And that would actually probably take more than a day. It's a pretty large birding trail. And here's the map of the area. Um, again, there are the, the wildlife refuge areas um, that you wouldn't want to enter, but you can still walk around the perimeter. Um, and there are dikes and ditches that you can walk along to get to some marshy habitat here along the shoreline, um, as well as observe a lot of these large uh, congregatory species as well. The mallards and uh, tundra swans can be found in some of the agricultural fields as well. And again, they have the contact information at the top and uh, little headquarter office or kiosk, information kiosk, and a couple of areas to put in if you have a kayak or a canoe. So Harsons Island um, is the next wetland wonder, and that's out at um, St. Clair Flat State Wildlife Area, the Harsons Island unit. And this is part of the largest freshwater delta in the world. This is out in southeast Michigan um, in Lake St. Clair. It's composed of approximately 25,000 acres of cattail, bulrush, and grasses with lots of open channels. Um, and this is a state recognized important bird area. Uh, the rest of Lake St. Clair is also an important bird area. Um, and it's highly important for breeding, migrating, and wintering waterfowl. Um, it also supports really high densities of rare marsh nesting species, including the black tern. Um, so this is a, a great photo. Um, we have a nest here, and I just wanted to see if folks could see where the nest was in the cattail. Um, this is a black tern nest and it blends in really well. Uh, if you were in a boat paddling by, you might not see it. Uh, and the eggs themselves are also very closely colored to that, that dead cattail and bulrush, um, which is what they prefer to nest in. Uh, this is a site that we've been doing a lot of black tern conservation and research in, in partnership with Michigan DNR and Detroit Audubon. Um, and we're doing some habitat work there as well. And this is an adult black tern. Um, they are back at Harsons Island. We got word a couple of weeks ago from one of our marsh bird volunteers um, and DNR uh, field staff also spotted more of them last week. So very excited to have them back. Other rare marsh nesting species that you can find at Harsons Island include American and least bitterns, Forster's terns, which also nest there, uh, marsh wrens, king rails, actually one of the historic breeding sites for king rails in the state, um, Virginia rail, Sora, purple martins, a lot of purple martins out there as well, and common gallinules. As far as what species you might see in really high concentrations during migration and also the winter months, um, that would be canvasbacks and tundra swans again. Um, this area is also part of the new St. Clair Macomb County Birding Trail. And the Blue Ways of St. Clair Water Trail, which includes Michigan's first national water trail. So you can learn a little bit more about those uh, birding trails and the Blue Ways 
uh, water trail by checking out the links in the chat. Um, it's another area that would be a great day trip, um, exploring some of those other pit stops along the birding trail or the water trail. So on eBird, you can see that there's a lot fewer checklists here than at Fish Point. Um, there's only 758 checklists here and 223 species detected. Um, so this area is, is underburdened compared to some of our other wetland wonders. Um, and part of that is because a short auto ferry ride is required or car ferry uh, to reach the island. So um, you have to take Champions Auto Ferry. They're the only folks that take folks across to the island. And it's a $15 round trip ticket, um, but it's cash only. So that's really important to note because not many places are cash only anymore. Um, but they run all day um, at all hours of the day and night. Uh, every 15 minutes or so. Um, so it's a, a really great place to have, again, a day trip um, where you can do wildlife viewing and birding uh, or hiking, as well as canoeing and kayaking. And here the, the headquarters office is located on Columbine Road. Again, phone number to speak with local field staff. Um, and then they have these very large wetland units. Both of these are about 800 acres that you can walk around on the impoundments and then you can view either from the impoundments or the roadsides um, a lot of this marsh as well in Little Muskamoot Bay. If you don't have a kayak uh, or boat yourself, um, you can still have a lot of really great viewing opportunities from the impoundments and, and roadsides and see a lot of great birds. So the next wetland wonder we're going to chat about is Muskegon County Resource Recovery Center. So this is formerly known as the Muskegon Wastewater System, which was a big eBird hotspot, still is. Um, and this is state recognized as an important bird area and includes 11,000 acres of all of these different circular ponds that you can see here. So some of them are for aeration, for water treatment or settling or spraying areas. Um, and they include lagoons or just open water. There are some dikes and impoundments throughout here as well, and fields. Um, so even though you tend to go to a wastewater area for water birds or uh, waterfowl, um, there is a good amount of grassland habitat here. So it's a great spot to view grassland birds as well in the summer. And it is adjacent to Muskegon State Game Area, which is just up the road. Um, and the headquarters office there, those are the folks that manage the waterfowl hunt here in the county resource recovery center. So here at the, the resource recovery center, the reason this area is designated as an important bird area is because it supports a really large diversity and abundance of migrating waterfowl and shorebirds. Um, so for shorebirds, it's particularly the semi-palmated sandpipers these little guys that look a lot like piping plovers. Um, so it's it, this is a good one to learn the difference of. Um, and then also Northern Shovelers, one of my favorites. This is uh, an Audubon Photography Award-winning photo that was actually taken at the Muskegon County uh, Recovery Center. So they also have very high densities like this of ruddy ducks. Um, you can see them in the hundreds to thousands there in the fall or early spring. Um, and the grass fields, I did mention the grasslands there, um, south of Apple Avenue are really excellent for upland sandpiper, short-eared owl, those grassland sparrows uh, that we all love, and hawks. So on eBird, there are over, or yeah, just over 11,000 uh, checklists, which is a lot. This is definitely an eBirding hotspot um, with 280 species detected. And nearby, we have Muskegon State Game Area's Lane's Landing, which is getting up there in its species count as well, 229 species with just over a thousand checklists um, on eBirds. So this is another area that's just adjacent to a big birding hotspot that can still offer a lot of really great species diversity um, that you can check out the next time you go to the, the Resource Center for a tour. 
Uh, we do have uh, an upcoming chapter that we'll be hosting, I know, a bird walk here um, that we'll be sharing on our My Birds um, Facebook page, and I believe that will be sometime in August. So stay tuned if you want to participate in a guided tour of the area. Um, species of note as well, we have the grasshopper sparrow here that is a breeding bird, as well as bald eagles. Lots of lesser yellow legs um, are seen here as well during migration. Uh, northern shovelers and ruddy ducks, as we mentioned, those short-eared owls, which are always really uh, amazing to see. Um, we also have trumpeter swan, Wilson sparrowlope, dunlins, another shorebird that you might not see uh, too often. Um, Dick Sissels, another grassland bird, and eared greaves and common loons have actually been seen breeding here in the past. So those are some fun species you might be able to spot heading out there uh, later this month or in June or July. So we're going to jump back over to uh, the Saginaw Bay area to Nyanquin Point State Wildlife Area. This is a state recognized important bird area in and of itself. Um, but it also falls within that larger globally recognized Saginaw Bay important bird area. This area is also part of that Saginaw Bay birding trail that I mentioned that Fish Point is also a part of. And this area has over 4,000 eBird checklists with 272 species detected. I wanted to mention that if you did want to do a day trip to uh, visiting Fish Point and Nyanquin, there is a third wildlife area just another half hour or so north uh, called Wigwam Bay State Wildlife Area, which is another state recognized important bird area um, that's just south of Tawas Point. And that area only has 127 eBird checklists um, compared to the 4,000 and I think over 10,000 that Tawas Point has. Um, and 185 species detected there. But that's one of those other areas that is a really beautiful spot, a beautiful uh, managed waterfowl hunt area um, that offers a lot of really great viewing opportunities and paddling opportunities and hiking opportunities um, that isn't on a lot of birders' radar. Um, Nyanquin Point itself um, has a really great accessible viewing platform at the end of Kitchen Road. So that's um, been updated recently um, and is now wheelchair accessible. Um, so that is a really great viewing deck. You can get really great views out over the mud flats here, um, as well as East Marsh, and see a lot of really great species. So Nyanquin Point is composed of coastal marsh, managed marsh, so that impounded marsh, um, as well as some agricultural cropland that we mentioned. They do some ag here to flood and feed waterfowl. And while it's only 1,500 acres in size, much smaller than a lot of the other areas we've been talking about so far, it provides such high quality diverse habitat that we still see really high concentrations of migratory birds and wetland wildlife here. Um, so it's a really great bang for your buck site. Um, and you can see really high concentrations of tundra swans here, like you can at Fish Point um, and Allegan and Greater Scop, as well as a plethora of diving duck species. So those are the ones where you'll get those really big rafts of canvas backs and buffle heads um, into the 20,000s, which is amazing to see in person, and that's uh, during spring and fall migration in particular. Lesser scop is most abundant in spring versus greater scop in the fall, um, and winter and spring um, up through about April, and maybe you'll be lucky with May. Um, we've had some late snowy owl sightings here as well. Um, it's another good spot for, for snowy owls. A lot of these wetland wonders um, tend to attract snowy owls when they're down here for the winter. my favorites to see in the winter time. So for the summer months, um, the next couple of months, birds that you might be able to see up at Nyanquin include breeding American and least bitterns, uh, breeding redhead ducks, common gallinules, uh, forsters, terns, and yellow-headed blackbirds. Um, this is a site that is known for being able to see yellow-headed blackbirds during migration, um, but they are also known to breed there. Um, and in addition to wildlife viewing, 
and birding here, Nyanquin and Wigwam um, state wildlife areas offer hiking, fishing, trapping, and kayaking and canoeing opportunities. So these are the species of note from our important bird area report for this site. Uh, we have some of the, the ducks that you would expect, gadwall, American black duck, um, American coot, but then we also have some, some other birds like American pipits and tree sparrows that can be seen in high numbers here. Um, those black-bellied plovers uh, that you can see during migration and um, horned larks, Lapland longspur, Henslow sparrows in the areas of this uh, wildlife area that are, have more grassland habitat. Um, and then we also have a willet and long-tailed duck and mallard that you can see in a pretty high concentrations. So we're gonna shoot south now um, to Point Mouye State Game Area uh, in Southeast Michigan, the lower Southeast Michigan. And while this area is a state recognized important bird area, it also falls within the globally recognized Detroit River important bird area. Point Mouye is a premier Michigan wetland um, of really key significance to water birds, waterfowl, and shorebirds. Um, this is a site that has really impressive diversity and high counts, and these are a few examples that we have, uh, again, based on our important bird area report. Um, tundra swans, over a thousand individuals, um, redheads, over 5,000 individuals, uh, wood ducks, 400 canvasbacks, 11,000. And then you have some great opportunities for shorebird viewing here, uh, particularly during fall migration, um, which for shorebirds kicks off in mid to end July. Um, so it's a great spot to see lesser yellow legs and short-billed dowagers. Um, there are also some great shorebirds nesting there, like American avocet and uh, black necked stilts. It's definitely one of the Great Lakes top shorebird stopovers. Um, and for a few years there, when we had really high water, there wasn't a lot of great shorebird habitat here, but that started to shift again, and we're starting to see more over the last couple of years um, show back up again, which has been really great. Um, so the Point Mouye State Game Area is a really huge wetland complex here, and while it does include Celeron and Stony Islands, um, most of the places that you'll have access to are going to be here in this a refuge unit and the, the main unit with these wetland, uh, impounded wetland areas. And then there's some uh, not impounded wetland out here at the mouth of the Huron River. Um, so this area is one of the reasons it is such a great spot. It is at the mouth of the Huron River where it meets Lake Erie. The site itself is also one of the largest freshwater marsh restoration projects in the world and it hosts an annual waterfowl festival each fall. So if you haven't been uh, to that waterfowl festival, I highly recommend it. It is usually um, promoted online and on Facebook. Uh, Michigan DNR participates, of course, um, and is a, a host and uh, shares information about how you can get involved. It's also a new field trip location for America's Biggest Week in Birding, and they just wrapped up uh, that biggest week in birding last week with a few field trips out to Point Mouye. Um, and our local Audubon chapter, Detroit Audubon, tends to host a series of guided birding tours at Point Mouye as well. So I recommend following them um, to learn about when their next uh, guided tour is if you're interested in participating in a guided tour. Point Mouye is a, a great spot, again, for a really diverse uh, amount of recreational opportunities. Here you can actually ride a bike on the impoundment system, um, as well as jog or hike and walk. Um, you also have access to um, put in so you can go kayaking or canoeing. Um, and it offers the dikes themselves while you're walking or on your bike, great viewing and birding opportunities. Um, it's it's just wonderful out there. It is very exposed, so make sure a lot of these areas are being wetlands, so make sure you layer up and have sunscreen and hats and water and all that jazz before you head out. 
Um, one thing to note that I, I meant to mention is that not all of these areas have restrooms on site. So um, that's definitely something you might want to call ahead and ask about. Um, Parsons Island, St. Clair Flats, there are restrooms at the headquarters office. Um, and I, yeah, that's that's kind of all I know at the moment. There might be others, but that's the one I know for sure has, has restrooms. So with Point Moye State Game Area, it got added to America's Biggest Week in Birding. So you can think, yes, it is definitely a big eBird hotspot. It's gotten a lot of attention in the media over the last few years as well, um, because it's a really great location for rare vagrants. So vagrants are bird species that end up far outside of their normal range. Um, that really usually draw a lot of birders, those the birders that are really excited to see a species and add it to their list that they probably wouldn't be able to see um, otherwise. So some of those vagrants uh, include, we had cinnamon teal there, um, we had uh, common red shank, um, and a few other really great species just in the last couple of years. Um, so it's a great spot to keep your eyes peeled for something you might not be expecting to see. Uh, and it's also great to just see all of these other wetland species that we really don't see in a lot of other places in Michigan, like glossy ibis and white-faced ibis. Those can be seen um, pretty frequently at Point Mouillé. Wimbrels, least bitterns are very difficult to see because they're so secretive, but we've had them there. black crown night herons as well. And then again, a lot of these, these diving ducks and dabbling ducks that can be found there in really big numbers. Um, and merlins uh, during raptor migration and sometimes breeding there uh, as well. And our next wetland wonder is Shiawassee River State Game Area. And this is a state recognized important bird area that adjoins the Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so this and that uh, wildlife refu refuge make up a really large uh, contiguous wetland complex. And it's partly why this area is uh, an important bird area along with the Shiawassee Wildlife Refuge. Um, it just draws in combined so many uh, waterfowl species and uh, wetland uh, reliant species, these vulnerable marsh birds that we are so interested in, in surveying and, and monitoring. Um, so it's a, another great site to visit if you haven't been before um, or if you've only been to the nearby Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge. Um, this is another spot that again is, is not as frequented by birders but is accessible to them and has a lot of great viewing opportunities. Um, so here, while only 185 species have been detected so far, that's only with 128 checklists on eBird, um, whereas the nearby Shiawassee Wildlife Refuge has over 250 bird species detected um, with over 2,500 checklists. So it's a much more heavily birded area. So this is the map for the state game area for Shiawassee. A lot of areas to hike um, and walk on a lot of these impoundments. You can get around to see wetlands as well as uh, some upland habitat and some of that uh, deciduous woodlands. Um, and in addition to wildlife viewing and birding here, you can again go fishing, canoeing, kayaking here, um, do some nature trail hiking as well, and uh, biking and jogging opportunities. There are annual uh, stewardship days hosted at Shiawassee River State Game Area as well uh, in partnership with Michigan United Conservation Club. Usually there's a winter wood duck uh, nest box building workshop and you go out and clean out um, the old nest boxes as well. Um, so that's a great one to keep your eyes peeled for. We usually share those on our MyBirds page um, and sometimes they do some habitat uh, work as well. So some species of note, a lot of our uh, diving and dabbling ducks in, again, very large uh, concentrations during migration. And then a lot of these species also breed here at Shiawassee. 
Um, so we have gadwall, American bittern, American black duck, and widgeon. Uh, we have northern pintail and shoveler, redheads, ringneck ducks, buffleheads, canvasbacks, and more. So if none of those seven wetland wonders are near you, there are another seven managed waterfowl hunt areas in the state that you can explore. And all 14 of these areas double as Audubon important bird areas. Um, pretty much all of these sites, I think all of them, um, yeah, just checking and confirming the list, are areas where we currently have um, monitors looking for black terns. So how are wetland wonders and important bird areas funded? Audubon doesn't have the capacity to support important bird area conservation outright. And so important bird areas and Audubon rely on partners, the landowners and managers um, of these important bird areas. So in Michigan, this primarily falls on the shoulders of DNR. As we saw, they own and manage over half of our important bird areas in the state. And all of our wetland wonders um, and managed waterfowl hunt areas are managed specifically by the Wildlife Division. So the Wildlife Division makes up 10% um, a, a of the larger DNR budget, um, as you can see here. And that 10% um, is very much reliant on hunter money. So 90% of that Wildlife Division budget um, comes from hunter dollars in the form of their hunting and fishing license fees, uh, as well as the excise taxes on firearms and ammunition from the Pittman-Robertson Act. Um, so there aren't a lot of other funding pathways or sources for the Wildlife Division, which is starting to become an issue, a larger conservation issue, because hunting has been in decline since the 1990s. Um, so in Michigan, we're seeing some increases in hunting, particularly in younger women, um, but it's not enough to offset the overall decline. And this means that the Wildlife Division is working with a smaller budget every year. Um, and one of the biggest threats uh, to these important bird areas is invasive species um, and being able to manage them and remove them. So how can you get involved? We have a few calls to action and then we'll be wrapping things up with the Q&A. Um, so ways for birders to support these areas. Um, again, like I mentioned, there aren't a lot of funding pathways. A lot of birders on our field trips always ask me how they can help. Um, when we start discussing this funding framework for the Wildlife Division. Um, and right now, there are just these few ways that you can support them, though we are looking at some other options. So um, first on the list is purchasing a migratory duck stamp. While this goes towards federal dollars that are used to purchase uh, wetlands for wetlands acquisition, um, that's still really helpful overall for wetlands conservation in the region. Um, you can also donate to Michigan's Non-Game Fish and Wildlife Trust Fund. Um, we'll be putting some links in the chat on where you can find this information. Uh, with them, the only way to donate is to actually send a check. Um, and then you can also donate to an Adopt a Game Area program. And while that's focused mostly on grassland habitat, um, which is causing uh, the loss of grassland habitat is causing the steepest population decline in grassland birds compared to any other uh, group of birds. Um, there are some of our wetland wonders on their uh, list as well, because a lot of these wetland wonders also have some grassland habitat. So there's still a way you can donate to some of these areas through that program. Um, you can also volunteer to be a community scientist. We do have black turn surveys at a lot of these wetland wonders and managed waterfowl hunt areas, um, as well as marsh bird surveys. Um, or you can also be a steward at your local public lands and get involved with MUCC or DNR stewardship days. Um, we also encourage you to engage with the wetland wonders strategic planning effort. So that's something that is new as of a couple of years ago. So our wetland wonders are undergoing a new strategic planning effort 
um, by a work group at DNR. Uh, Caitlin is sitting uh, on that work group, and it's been charged with developing a 10-year strategic plan to define priorities for both hunting and non-hunting recreation, as well as habitat management of these wetland wonders. So the new plan um, hopes to provide management consistency between the areas while also recognizing their uniqueness. So there is a new survey out um, that we will send your way uh, for public input. If you're interested in providing input on uh, the strategic planning of these areas for the next 10 years, uh, definitely click on that link and we'll be sending that out as well in a follow-up email. Excuse me. We also have the following upcoming opportunities. Saturday, June 3rd, we have the Blue Water Sturgeon Festival up at Port Huron. Um, sorry about that, where uh, my birds, uh, myself, and our partners, Detroit Audubon, will be tabling and presenting on our Black Turn work at St. Clair Flats. On June 10th, we'll be out at Muskegon State Game Area leading a birding tour with our My Birds Ambassadors, a Washtenong Audubon Islands, or a Washtenong Islands Audubon Society, excuse me, and Muskegon County's Nature Club. That afternoon, we'll also be working with our partners at the Lower Grand River Organization of Watersheds annual kayak and paddle trip, um, which is along the Grand River. So we'll be looking for birds while we're paddling out there. Um, and then on Saturday, June 17th, there's going to be a spring open house at St. Clair Flat State Wildlife Area on Harsons Island. Um, and you'll be able to see Caitlin there um, and some of our other colleagues. And then again, I, I mentioned stewardship opportunities uh, with the Michigan DNR and MUCC. They have events uh, throughout the year. And with that, I'll open things up for some questions and pass things over to Caitlin. Okay, so I think we were able to answer a lot of them as we went. Um, but Erin, there was a question about, are other properties in the IBA, such as those owned by land conservancies or the nature conservancy? And I'll drop them into the chat as I reread them. Great, thanks, Caitlin. Um, yes, there are the other half of uh, the important bird areas in Michigan are owned by a variety of different organizations, um, some of which include federal government, Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, excuse me, as well as the Land Conservancy folks, um, in addition to Michigan Audubon, who has their own um, set of sanctuaries. Perfect. And then um, before I ask the next question, could you click back to the full state map with all the 14 uh, birding sites on it for folks? Sure, yeah. There we go. All right. And the next question was, um, what measures are taken to determine cryptic marsh bird populations? Because they are cryptic, are population counts based in presence data, or are there assumed numbers based on calculating territory or carrying capacity? That's a great question. So I know uh, Michigan Natural Features Inventory leads a set of secretive marsh bird surveys uh, at different routes across the state, and that has limited coverage. Uh, we also have breeding bird surveys that happen each season, and while those are not specific to secretive marsh birds, um, so there's like an asterisk there with the breeding bird survey, you might miss detections just because of their nature. Um, and because of that, at the areas that we um, at Audubon Great Lakes are working at with Michigan DNR and other partners, um, we are doing additional secretive marsh bird monitoring with the help of volunteer community scientists um, following an audio playback um, survey protocol. So that's specific to marsh birds. It happens just before sunrise um, and allows us to have the most accurate detections. And that is based on um, abundance as opposed to calculating out or modeling out um, a potential population um, based on carrying capacity. And kind of to piggyback off of that one, this question just came in. 
asking if there's a source for current or new sightings that after 40 years, one of our attendees has been very puzzled by a new large and loud visitor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I would say as far as new records go, exploring those eBird checklists, um, there are some species that are protected in, in that sense. So, for example, Virginia rail, you won't be able to see specific locations about where they're seen on eBird. Um, the same goes for other state endangered species uh, or federally endangered species, but that would be your best bet for updated records. Perfect. And then I've had this asked a couple of times now of whether or not there is a, a list of IBA areas, um, both public and private, that are open to the public. Um, I did share kind of the dashboard where you can explore, but it's that's not so much of a static list. It kind of depends on the scale. So for folks that did click that, I'll drop it again. You can zoom in and out. And depending on what scale you're zoomed in or out at, it'll list them on the right hand side. But Aaron, I don't know if you know of a just standalone list of those. The, the dashboard replaced our standalone list. So yeah, that's that's all we have to work with right now. Perfect. Um, and then the last question we had was, I think again, regarding important bird areas. Um, and someone was curious about the raptor flyway over Brockway Mountain in the Cuban Peninsula. And I just kind of suggested that maybe you might sit, um, talk about what the, you know, what boxes need to be checked to be considered an important bird area, and if that might explain why some areas are or are not included. Yeah, so, so with that, um, it, it is mostly thinking about the, the congregatory species, um, how many are there, uh, how many you see flying over. We do have another kind of hawk watch type area out at Lake Erie Metro Park that is an important bird area. Um, and, and usually it's one or more of those four criteria. So again, either sensitive species of conservation concern are present or supported by that site, um, or they're, uh, restricted species, um, or habitat, uh, reliant species. Perfect. And then... So another question came in, how well, there are plans on creating any new wetland wonders in the state of Michigan. There are not right now. Um, there are no new plans to create new ones just to kind of focus efforts on managing the ones we have. That's not to say, you know, we're, we're constantly looking to acquire um, properties. That's always something that local biologists are watching. Um, so it's totally possible that if we were to acquire more land that we could end up with additional wetland wonders. Um, and I just saw one more question. Oh, where do you sign up for the outings? I believe that's probably referring to our open houses. Um, and you don't need to sign up uh, for those. Um, you can just come on out. We can host as many people as want to arrive. So there will be some more detailed information going out here as we, we nail down some details. So yeah, and I think we, I didn't mention that that starts or plans to start at 9 a.m. on June 17th, um, and I can create a Facebook page on the MyBirds page um, for that open house. So folks, if you want to learn more information, once all the details get nailed down, you can check back at MyBirds and we'll have that information posted. And it looks like I just saw one more coming. Let's see, we've got another minute um, asking if we offer guided hikes. Um, Mostly not, not on an individual basis. Um, if folks stop in at any of our areas, staff are happy to suggest places to check out. Um, you know, we're not, no one's trying to hide information. So we're happy to tell people, you know, where we're seeing things or where they're going to have the best shot at finding the birds they're looking for. Um, but the open houses, you know, we're, we are there to, you know, try to open up the area to folks to go, to go check those out. So we don't necessarily guide them, but we do have staff, um, at least at Harsons Island, spread out on the area um, as kind of touch points um, to guide people. So not kind of a one-on-one, -on -one, but there, there is some guidance, at least at the open houses, and you're more than welcome to stop in to talk to staff anytime that we're, that we're available at the areas. And I will say um, in the past, uh, DNR and my birds have hosted spring birding tours at these areas um, that was put on pause during COVID um, and we, there's some staffing being spread thin. So we haven't brought those back yet. 
Um, but I am hoping to, at least personally for my birds, get one or more um, on the calendar for each spring. Um, so just keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and again, these open houses are also um, coming back for spring and fall. So we'll be sharing that information out as well. Um, and there, there could be more coming. Um, so we'll just keep you posted. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for spending this last hour with us. Uh, I really hope you think this was helpful information. Again, we'll follow up with an email uh, with a recording of this webinar, along with some of those links we shared in the chat. Um, and we hope you all have a great rest of your evening and hope to see you out in the field at some point. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. All right, bye all.